For this lecture, I'll be explaining the five major promotional mix tools for communicating customer value. I'll discuss the change in communication landscape and the need for integrated marketing communications. Now, later in the lecture, I'll do an exploration of the major decisions involved in developing advertising programs, and it will end with how companies use public relations to communicate with the environment outside the company. A company's total promotional mix, also sometimes called the marketing communication mix, consists of a specific blend of tools. The company uses these tools to engage customers, persuasively communicate customer value, and build customer relationships. Now, each tool has a unique characteristic and cost. Now, advertising can reach a mass of geographically dispersed buyers at rather a low cost per exposure. It enables sellers to repeat a message many times. Now, because advertising is sort of of a public nature, consumers tend to view advertising products as more legitimate. Moreover, advertising can be used to build up long-term images for a product, and it can trigger quick sales. However, advertising does have some shortcomings. First, it can be very expensive. And although it reaches many people quickly, advertising is impersonal, it lacks direct persuasiveness, and while the ads can be tailored to your target market, the company is also paying for non-targeted customers to hear and see these ads. Sales promotion includes a wide assortment of tools like you know, coupons and contests and premiums and all of a lot of different things, to be honest, all of which have many unique qualities. They attract customers' attention, they offer strong incentives to purchase, and can be used to basically dra dramatize products' offerings, and sometimes even the boosting lagging in sales. Sales promotions invites and rewards quick responses. However, sales promotions' effects tend to be very short-lived. Now, personal selling involves personal interactions between two or more people, so each person can observe the other person's need and characteristic. They can also make some quick adjustments. Personal selling allows all kinds of customer relations to spring up, ranging from a you know, sort of matter-of-fact relationship to personal friendships. But personal selling is the company's most expensive promotional mix tool. Public relation, though, involves news stories, features, sponsorship, events that seem more real and believable to readers than ads. PR can reach many prospects who avoid salespeople and advertisements. It can play up a company and a product. You know, a well-thought-out public relations campaign used with other promotional mix elements is extremely effective and economical. And finally, many forms of digital and direct marketing, from direct mails to catalogs, telephone marketing to online mobile and social media, all share some distinctive characteristics. Direct marketing is more targeted. It usually directs to a specific customer or customer community. Now, direct marketing is immediate, personalized, and can be very interactive. Thus, direct and digital marketing are well suited to highly targeted marketing offers, creating customer engagement and building one-on-one -on -one relationships. However, none of these things can really be used all by itself. We have to look at an integrative marketing com communication, or what we call IMC. Now, this refers to carefully integrating and coordinating the company's many different communication channels to deliver a clear, consistent, and compelling message about an organization and its brands. Several major factors are changing the face of today's marketing communications. First, consumers are changing. You know, in this digital wireless world, consumers are better informed and more empowered with their communication channels. Rather than relying on marketer-supplied information, they can use the internet, social media, and other technologies to find the information on their own. You know, second, marketing strategies are changing. As mass marketers have fragmented, marketers are shifting away from mass marketing. More and more, they're developing focused marketing programs designed to engage customers and build customers' relationships in a more narrowly defined sort of micro-market way. Finally, sweeping advances in digital technology are causing remarkable changes in the way that companies and customers just basically communicate with each other. 
You know, in this new marketing communication world, rather than using old approaches that interrupt customers and force feed them mass messages, new media formats let customers reach smaller communities and customers in more interactive and engaging ways. In this new marketing communication model, we've seen that a mix of both the traditional mass media and the wide array of online, mobile, and social media that's available to companies have increased and engaged targeted communities in a more personalized way. You know, rather than just creating and playing TV ads or print ads or some sort of a Snapchat brand story ad, many marketers now view themselves in a more broadly as sort of content marketing managers. They create, inspire, and share brand messages and conversations with and among customers across a fluid mix of paid, owned, earned, and shared communication channels. You know, these channels include medias that are both traditional and new, controlled and non-controlled information sources. Now, an example of this new marketing communication model is Method's successful and long-running clean and happy campaign that began as an online-only effort and still relies heavily on digital and social media, supported only by carefully targeted regional cable TV ads in very select markets. In fact, all the products you've seen on this slide come from companies started with only online communication marketing efforts. Now, to summarize, the explosion development in communication technologies and changes in marketers and customers' communication strategies have dramatic impact on marketing communications. The new digital and social media have given birth to more targeted social and engaged marketing communication models. Along with traditional media, advertisers are now adding a broad selection of more specialized and highly targeted media to engage smaller customer segments with more personalized and interactive content. They're adapting a richer, more fragmented media and promotional mix to reach their diverse markets. Companies, though, do risk creating communications hodgepodge for consumers. Now, to prevent this, the companies are adopting that integrated marketing communication, the IMC I just talked about. Guided by an overall IMC strategy, the company develops the roles that various promotional tools will play and the extent to which each will be used. A carefully coordinated promotional activity and timing when major campaigns take place can have dramatic effects and success for most companies. There are two basic promotional mix strategies, push versus pull promotion. The primary difference between push and pull marketing lies in how customers are approached. Now, each strategy gives emphasis to specific promotional tools to accomplish the push or pull strategy. Now, in a pull strategy, it implies that you are implementing a strategy that will draw customers toward your product. It refers to a promotional mix or strategy that calls for a lot of spending on consumer advertising and promotion to induce customers to buy the product, creating a demand vacuum that pulls the product through the channel. So in this case, let's say that I am a manufacturer of electric toothbrushes. I'm going to run a promotional campaign. As I run that promotional campaign, my customers are going to view it. They will then go to the retailer and require or request that product. If the retailer doesn't have that product in the store, then they're going to go to the manufacturer and have that product brought in to satisfy their consumer's needs. Now, in a push strategy, it means you're trying to promote a specific product to an audience you find relevant. It refers to a promotional strategy that calls for using a sales force and a trade promotion to push the product through the channel. The producer promotes the product to channel members that in turn promotes it to its final consumers. So I am still this manufacturer of electric toothbrushes. I go to the retailer. I say I'd like to set up a display and I'd like to sell my electric toothbrushes in your store. I do an in-store promotion and once my customers come to the retail store and see this in-store promotion, they may be tempted to buy the electric toothbrushes. The manufacturers push this product into the railers and into the consumer's hands. We're going to take a specific look at advertising now. Remember, this is just a general overview. For many of you, you'll go on and take whole courses, maybe even a degree in advertising. I picked up this Coca-Cola ad because it featured Hilda Clark. She was a famous singer, actor, and model and socialite on the East Coast before becoming the face of Coca-Cola in 1895. 
And what's interesting about her, she became the first woman to be featured on the tin of a Coca-Cola tray. But what's interesting about the ad is that basically it's advertising Coca-Cola as a brain tonic. Yeah, her likeness actually would appear in Coca-Cola advertising bookmarks, calendars, billboards, trading cards, clocks, coupons, and more until 1903 when she finally married a millionaire and decided to retire from show business. The other big one that we think about with Coca-Cola is Santa. Now, Coca-Cola did not create the legend of Santa, but Coca-Cola advertising did play a big role in shaping the jolly character as we know it today. While the wed suit and white trim had been around for a while, I mean, there's a famous Norman Rockwell Saturday Evening Post four years before the first Coca-Cola ad that depicts Santa in much the same way. But before 1931, there were many different depictions of Santa Claus around the world. That included this tall, gaunt man and an elf. There was even a scary Santa Claus. But starting in 1931, Coca-Cola started a Christmas ad campaigns due to low sales during this time, featuring the jolly Santa drawing. While Coca-Cola did not create Santa, what we can do is give Coca-Cola some credit for cementing the modern image of Santa Claus in the public's consciousness. As in this era before the advent of television, before color motion pictures came, became common, and before the widespread use of color in newspaper, Coca-Cola magazine advertisements, billboards, and point-of-sale store displays were for many Americans their primary exposure to the modern Santa Claus image. Coca-Cola ads popularized an image that they had borrowed and not one they had created. But it's thanks to their advertising that we have the more modern jolly Santa rather than that elf or little scary guy. Advertising decision making involves determining the objectives, the budget, message, media, and finally the evaluation of the results. Advertisers should set a clear objective as to whether the advertising is supposed to inform, persuade, or remind buyers. The advertising budget can be based on what's affordable, on sales, on competitor spending, advertising objectives, and tasks. The message decision calls for planning and creating concepts or big ideas, and the message strategy and the execution of it effectively. Media decisions involve defining the reach, frequency, impact, and engagement goals. You know, choosing major media types, selecting media vehicles, and deciding on media timing. Message and media decisions must be closely coordinated for maximum campaign effectiveness. And finally, evaluation calls for evaluating the communication and sales effort for the advertising and other brand content before, during, and after its place, measuring advertising's return on investment. Now we're going to look at each one of these and break them down a little bit more specifically. An advertising objective is a particular communication task to be accomplished with a specific target audience during a particular time period. Advertising objectives can be classified by their primary purpose, which is to inform, persuade, or remind. So informative advertising creates awareness of brand, product, service, and ideas. It announces new products and programs and can educate people about the attributes and benefits of the new or established product. Informative advertising is also used to sometimes correct false impressions and inform of price changing. So Berber King used informative advertising to make customers aware of their reduced calorie and fat new fries. Uh, the public did try them, but the product was not accepted, and it was pulled later from their menu. Persuasive advertising tries to convince customers that the company's service or products are best. It works to alter perceptions and enhance images of a company or the product. Its goal is to influence customers to take an action, to switch brands, you know, try a product, or maybe remain loyal to a current brand. So after Bud Light took some jabs at Miller Light for using corn syrup in their beer during a Super Bowl ad, Miller Light decided to throw a few punches back. A day later on Twitter, they revealed that their beer actually has less calories and carbs than Bud Light, which helped them to persuade people that drinking Bud Light and Miller Light actually have similar health benefits. Reminder advertising basically is to let people, to remind people basically about the need for the product or service or the feature or benefit that will be provided when they purchase this product promptly. The objective is to keep the brand in the customer's mind maybe during off seasons and remind the consumer that the product will be needed perhaps in the near future. 
The Got Milk campaign has been very successful with many celebrities also featured in the ad, reminding people to drink milk even as an adult. An advertising budget is an estimate of a company's promotional expenditures over a certain period of time. More importantly, it is the company's money that they're willing to set aside to accomplish their marketing objectives. When creating an advertising budget, a company must weigh the value of spending an advertising dollar against the value of the dollar as a recognized revenue. Now understand, this can be a great deal of money. I mean, Disney spent about $3.15 billion, that's with a B, in 2019. But that was mere pennies compared to the number one spender in 2019, Amazon at $6.88 billion, and number two, Comcast at $6.14 billion. That's six of the tallest buildings in the world of dollar bills stacked up. So this isn't mere pennies we're talking about. Now, there are four common methods used to set a total budget for advertising. The affordable method is set aside just enough money to fund operations. It's popular with startups that see a positive return on investment on their advertising spending. The key is to anticipate when that strategy will start to show diminishing returns and know when to switch strategies. Now, the percentage of sale is simply allocating a specific percentage based on the previous year's total gross sales or average sales. It's pretty common for businesses to spend between two to 5% on annual revenues on advertising. But understand, it can be much more than that. Procter & Gamble spends between 11 and 12% of its total over $4 billion each year it spends in advertising. Now, this strategy is simple and safe, but it is based on past performance and may not be the most flexible choice for this ever-changing market plate. It also assumes that sales are directly linked to advertising. Now, comparative parity is basically adhering to an industry average for advertising cost. Of course, no market is exactly the same, and as such, this strategy may not be sufficiently flexible for companies. With an objective and task strategy, the company will determine the objectives and the resources needed to, to achieve them. The method also has its own pros and cons. On the upside, it can be the most targeted method of budgeting and the most effective. On the downside, it can be very expensive and a bit risky. Now, when creating an advertising budget, a company must weigh the value of spending advertising dollars against the value for that dollar as recognized revenue. Knowing consumers and having their demographic profile can help guide advertising spending. The first step in creating effective advertising message is to plan a message strategy, basically the general message that will be communicated to consumers. The advertiser must next develop a compelling creative concept or big idea, what will bring the message strategy to life, its distinctive and memorable way. The creative concept will guide the choice of specific appeals to be used in an advertising campaign. Now, advertising appeals are communication strategies used to grab attention and persuade people to buy. Advertising appeals provide evidence or provoke an emotional response that help to convince target audience to buy a certain product or service. Regardless of what that product or service is you're marketing, it's vital to understand your audience and understanding what motivates them. Now, there are many, many different types of appeal, but I'm going to go over eight of the most common strategies used to reach target audiences. So the emotional appeals are designed to make an audience associate positive feelings with your brand. These brands generally focus on trust, love, loyalty, happiness, which you can leverage through the use of powerful music and imagery. You can kind of think of GE's bring, bringing good things to life. The fear appeal to people when a product or service is needed to help reduce a risk in life. The risk could be financial failure, poor health, security of losing a home, political choices, or even a risk of being ostracized by the public. Now, the emotion of fear can be useful, effective, as long as it's not extreme or too harsh, which may ultimately affect your brand. Therefore, caution is in order. You know, let's think about those life insurance campaigns. They basically say things like, how would they get along without you? The humor appeal is often used in advertising. I mean, why not? 
Who doesn't like something funny? You know, appealing to the comic sense of people can build a brand, sometimes even just overnight. The challenge with humor, however, is to keep the brand in the humor. So your market associate the humor with your brand. Often it's the humor that's remembered more than the product. But if done right, making an audience laugh can lead to huge sales. Chick-fil-A beef cows holding up their sign saying eat more chicken has been extremely successful in both humor and in the brand name recognition. Like humor, music is a great way for brands to get noticed and to make an audience remember their product. In addition, musical appeals can bring up positive memories whenever somebody hears a catchy tune in an ad, which goes a long way toward making them feel good about the product being presented. And don't forget the options of licensing some great tunes from the past. Now, Apple iPod got a huge le lift with the Jets song, Are You Gonna Be My Girl? And the Jets also got a great boost. This can make it appealing to both the consumer and a musical artist. Now, while some products can effectively persuade consumers with tugs on the heartstrings, other products demand more rational approach, especially if the ad is used in print media. Rational appeals use logic, facts, and data to convince com consumers to buy products, and they are often found in advertisements for medication, cookware, and cleaning products. Now, Fuji's new Golf driver used a great deal of technical information when they brought this driver out. Describe how, if buying it, you would get a longer shot from this more expensive driver. Talk a little bit about sexual appeals. I mean, from jeans to cars to cologne, hamburgers, they have all relied on sex and romance, have been found in any number of products. Now, history has shown that sex does indeed sell, or at least it gets attention. Sexual appeals have been used so often that in some cases, using them may not pack the punch that marketers may expect. Now, a recent meta-analysis of 80 different studies on sexual appeals showed some mixed results. While people remembered the ad, they didn't exactly remember the product or the brand that was being advertised. And as you might think, women in general did not favor sexual appeal, but men did. However, what was interesting was that while men may have liked looking at the ads, they tended to have a negative attitude toward the brands using this appeal, along, of course, with the women. And it seems as if both gender genders had a negative attitude about sexual appeals and products they viewed as not being related to sexual activities. You know, I guess toilet paper is just not sexy. Now, all in all, the research seems to indicate that while sexual appeals might be useful for getting eyes on the advertisement, sex is by no means guaranteed to ensure that people like what they're seeing once you have their attention. This appeal, like all appeals, needs to be used selectively and targeted correctly to the audience in the correct context if it's going to be successful in increasing people's interest in buying. Now, Burger King has had many missteps towards using sexual appeals, including some ads that have been banned. And if you've never seen the 2012 Carl Jr. Paris Hilton ad, which basically produced more jokes than sales, I strongly remember, recommend that you look it up. However, I will say that their 2014 remake of the ad, which used humor, was much better received. Now, you'll only understand the humor in the 2014 ad if you've watched the 2012 with Paris Hilton first. Again, kind of fun to do. The scarcity appeal taps into people's fear of missing out. So they're a great way to convince people to take advantage of a sale or a limited edition product. However, make sure the scarcity actually applies to what you're selling. If you're advertising a limited time offer, customers will notice if it goes on longer than advertised and they may lose trust in your customer's promotion. Make sure also that the sale is truly a sale. There are also a lot of regulations around this these days. Now, brands often partner up with celebrities to give their products more credibility. But remember, an endorsement only works if the celebrity is loved by your target audience. Big name fashions such as Gucci and Chanel use various celebrities as the face of their clothing, perfumes, and cosmetics all the time. But standard products also have seen their fair share of celebrity endorsements. 
Now, remember that certain appeals will only work for certain products. A company needs to understand what the brand stands for and whether the strategy truly fits your brand's characteristic. Now, once an appeal has been chosen, then an execution style needs to be selected. This message can be presented in various execution styles, again, matching the style to your target audience. So if we look at some of these appeals, we can also see some execution styles. We can see a musical one. We can see a humor one. We can see even a technical expertise one. It doesn't mean that your appeal has to match with the execution style, but sometimes they sort of do. It's going to be kind of hard to use a humor appeal, but use a scientific evidence. But you could use humor and musical. With endorsements, again, if you're going to use endorsements, you could actually use a technical expert or a scientific expert, but you probably aren't going to be able to use some of the other ones, um, such as fantasy, because basically, Fantasy and endorsement don't go together because of the celebrity concept. So it's important to match no matter what you do, both the appeal and the execution to your target market. Many marketers have subscribed to a new merger of advertising and entertainment called Madison and Vine. It basically is a takeoff on Hollywood and Vine. It represents the merging of advertising and entertainment to create a new avenue for reaching customers with more engaging message. Thus, the creation of advertaining. This is a term used to describe entertainment that incorporates elements of advertising. And it's basically a practical way to integrate brand communication within the content of entertainment products such as movies, TV shows, songs. Now, there are three main types of advertaining. Product placement, which refers to goods and services that are featured in media and, you know, they're basically there to promote an item. There's product integration, a form of product placement in which the product actually plays a role in the plot or program of the film. And brand entertainment, entertainment that basically is created by brands to capture the attention of consumers for prolonged periods. The objective here is to make the brand as inseparable part of some other form of entertainment or content. Now, James Bond films have been very well known for very heavy product placement. In the Bond film Spectre, you'll be able to see or hear, just to name a few brands, Belvedere Vodka, Globetrotter Luggage, Heineken Beer, Macallan Whiskey, Omega Watches, Tom Ford Suits, and then they're the cars. Ah. The famous Aston Martin Bond car, you know, if anybody ever wants to buy me one, I'll accept it gratefully. There are Fiat cars in that film. The bad guys Jaguar car, Land Rovers, Range Rovers, Mercedes Benz, and there are actually even more brands of that as far as cars are concerned in that particular film. When you come to picking the media, there are many advantages and limitations to each media, and I'm not going to go over every single one of these. You can see them for yourself. But I do sometimes get people ask me about newspapers. You know, is there really even a reason for newspapers? And you might think of newspapers these days as more being specialty advertising. There are still many newspapers that produce um, content for specific areas, and also they now have a lot of online services for newspapers. So the online service is very much like their actual paper newspapers. And many of you may even still go out and buy the Thanksgiving papers. So you can think of newspapers, perhaps not in the old ways of where we looked at them on a daily basis, but think of them more as specialty newspapers and being used for um, specific items and at specific times. So here are the next three sort of mediums to look at. There's two of them on here. You know, a little bit I want to address about each one, I guess. For direct mail, we are talking about things that go in the mailbox. That's why at this point it's not connected with the digital that you just saw on the last slide. And I know that we've been connecting digital and direct mail quite often together because they're both basically doing the same thing, which is bringing an advertisement directly to a person through a mailbox of sort, you know, whether or not that mailbox is your email address or that mailbox is your actual mailbox. <laughs> They're both sort of doing the same thing. But here we do divide them up because there are different limitations for each group. Now, 
you also have found, at least that's what we have found so far. And of course, marketing is something that always changes. But as of right now, direct mail seems to be working really best for local companies, local producers, and especially a lot of things that happen to do with labor or with routine maintenance. So your air conditioners, your plumbers. Um, yes, you have online ads for that, but it's really hard with the online ads to sometimes catch that person who is just within your service code. But that direct mailer will be there and they can pick that up. They may take that direct mailer and then look you up. And you say, oh, but there's Yelp and things like this. The problem with some of those websites recently have been that uh, customers are beginning to not trust them as much as they did. They've learned that there are people who are hired to do nothing but put good ads up there, uh, put good reviews and ratings. So you're finding that there's some trustness of those websites that are just beginning to deteriorate. So don't completely distrust direct mail, especially if you're going for an older consumer who's much more used to looking at direct mail pieces. Uh, magazines have, of course, both the hard print copies and quite often an online copy. So when they talk about long life and a pass along readership, the pass along readership really is more for the printed one. But the long life, you can keep that magazine in a download version for quite a long time. Um, and the other thing is, is that you really do get really good uh, demographic targeting in magazines. I mean, if I just want to hit fly fishermen, there's a magazine for just fly fishermen. If I want to hit people who just do puzzles, there's a magazine for people who do puzzles. Um, my son happens to like amusement parks. So he's got a magazine that comes to him four times a year. That's just about amusement parks. So they're highly targeted magazines, but they can be high cost because they have maybe a limited number of readership. So they have to charge more. And then with radio, there is some iffiness you might want to say. Where does something like Spotify or Pandora fit? Do they come under radio or do they come underneath something else? Um, this is an introduction to marketing class, so we're not going to make the argument of where something like iTunes and um, Spotify and Pandora fall under. When you take and if you take a full advertising class, you'll kind of approach that at that point. But for now, let's keep them underneath radio as for this particular lecture. And lastly, I bring outdoor. Now I put outdoor by itself because one of the things I find when I talk with students is that they quite often don't understand the power of outdoor advertising. They see it as maybe cliche, but yet outdoor advertising has great flexibility and something that should not be underutilized or underlooked at. Um, I don't know about you, but I drive up and down 95 a great deal. And I know that when I see these signs that tell me what advertising, whatever food or gasoline is at that exit, those are significant to me. I'm looking for something to eat. I'm looking at those ads. And that is an outdoor advertising. Basically, anything that you see outside is outdoor advertising. And there's some quite unique ones, like the one for the pasta company down there in the bottom where the, the two people look like they're sucking up the rope and it's really, it's about pasta. Um, things like subways where people, you know, may not always be constantly looking at their phone. They aren't, they're going to get off at the next stop or something. There's all kinds of things that people really notice. And it also is a way to grab attention. But the thing with outdoor advertising is that generally they have to be short. You have to be able to understand it in a very quick sense. This is where your icons and your logos become so important. Because one of the things you'll notice about almost every one of these is there's not a lot of print. It tends to be very quick to understand what the product is. Just don't overlook outdoor. And remember, outdoor is more than just billboards. It's anything that basically doesn't fit in the other categories. Now, measuring advertising effectiveness has become kind of this hot issue for most companies, especially in these economic game challenging times. We want to know whether or not we're getting basically a bang for our buck. So one way to look at is sort of traditional, it's return on advertising investment, ROAI, very similar to ROI for those who know what that is. It's basically referring to what's the net return or what, how much return are we getting for every dollar that we invest in advertising. Now, 
with this, what we're going to find is that when you go on into advertising measurements, you'll probably in financial measurements, you'll cover this a little bit more deeply. But again, this is sort of just an introduction to marketing. So we're not going to get into actually how you calculate that. But advertisers should also regularly evaluate two other types of advertising results, the attitude effect and the sales and profit effect. Now, measuring the attitude effect of an ad or ad campaign tells whether the ad or media is communicating the ad message well. After all, after an ad is run, we really want to make sure the consumer remembers the ad in the product. Advertisers can measure how the ad affected the customer's recall or product awareness, the knowledge, and basically their preferences. Remember just a few slides back, we talked about using sexuality as an appeal. And while the people remembered the ad, they couldn't remember the actual product. So was that ad effective? Meaning is, did we get any bang for our buck if they couldn't remember the product that we were advertising? Now, there are generally five ways we test attitudes. It's something called direct questioning, rating scales, checklist, seismic differential, and partially structured interviews. Again, for those of you who are going on into advertising as a direct field of study, you'll get a little bit more into these, especially when you get into things like consumer behavior. Sales and profit effects of advertising are often harder to measure. One way to measure the sales and profit effect of advertising is to compare past sales and profits with past advertising expenditures. So if I made a 10% you know, return on my money and I spent 2% in advertising, then you know, how did I do this year? And if I did exactly the same, then I know basically how it's going. But if I returned more money, then maybe my advertising is working better. If I returned less money, maybe my advertising is working as well. Another way is through basically experimentation. And there's a lot of that going on because of the inability to sort of get direct numbers on some of this stuff. Also, with the rise of online advertising, new methods of measurement are being explored. Measures such as you know, click-through rates and pay-per-click are helpful to understand the costs involved with online ads. But it's really revenue per click that will look at the amount of revenue that is generated by online ads. You know, as of this date for this lecture, which may be dating the lecture, it appears that this is the most helpful way to determine if the cost of ads that a company is spending generate actual revenue when we're talking about online ads. However, remember that not all ads are about direct revenue generation. Reminder advertising is more about keeping, you know, our brand in the mind of the consumer, especially in industries where they have seasons. Now, because there are so many factors that affect advertising effectiveness, some are controllable and others are not by companies. You know, measuring the results of advertising and spending is kind of, well, basically an inexact science. Those of you who are going to go into this as a career field, you really will get into this much deeper as you move through your programs. So we've sort of finished with advertising. Let's kind of move into public relations. Now, public relation is used to promote products, places, people, ideas, activities, organizations, even nations. Now, companies use PR to build good relationships with consumers and investors. We have to build good relationship with the media and our local communities. Trade associations tend to use PR to rebuild interest in commodities that people may have sort of put off to the side, like eggs and apples, potatoes, and yes, even chocolate milk. In fact, one of the best known successful PR campaigns is Got Milk. This PR campaign created a, a strong campaign that promoted health benefits and actually boosts the consumption of chocolate milk. So public relation is a strategic approach toward the creation of goodwill and brand image through the development of a relationship between the organization and its target audience. You know, every organization exists in a social, legal, political environment where it has to interact with different agencies and individuals. Public relations can be that strong impact that is needed for public awareness at a much lower cost than advertising. Now, the public relations department or PR is responsible for many things. You know, one is basically increased awareness. I mean, the company and the PR department are primarily focused on spreading the awareness by making people understand the product specifications and brand values. They help create brand image and basically a reputation. 
the company has the chance to improve its image and build up a reputation among the public through many of the public relation activities and practices. Now, they develop loyalty because customers generally are loyal you know, to brands because of intense public relation practices. They tend to buy from companies repeatedly if that loyalty is built up. It also promotes goodness because in the long term, public relations practices pave the way for creating substantial and sustainable goodwill for the company. Finally, it builds trust and credibility for the company. I mean, the repetitive brand promotion is done in a way to align the company's objectives to those of the society and the target market that they are basically dealing with. You know, developing trust and credibility among the public is a way to be successful and to see an increase in profits. Good, strong business communications lead to building up of strong relationships and healthy business practices. Thus, the PR department and the PR experts that work in those departments need to consider many different types of public relations for an organization to have healthy growth. You know, the PR department collects information from the press or the media sources while maintaining sort of a cordial relationship with them. You know, the data is used for companies to help plan its marketing strategies. And in return, we may be able to use the media in order to get ahead of things or to be able to communicate to our public in a different way besides just advertising. Investors, well, basically, they're the essential to an organization. Hence, the PR department keeps them informed, manages their events, you know, does releasing of financial reports. It manages questions and complaints. Maintaining, basically, a relationship with shareholders and others in the financial community is one of the key responsibilities of the PR department. There's no question we need to adhere to various government regulations like corporate social responsibility, employee welfare, and consumer protection, fair trade practices. Building the organization's relationship with the government will allow an organization to understand and basically work with the government rather than trying to work against the government. And no matter what, society plays a crucial role in deciding the company's well-being, as long as its product line also. A company organization needs to create positive images of the brand and the company by supporting social practices like saying, you know, no to child labor or child education, equality, environmental protection. We don't need the community to go against us. Internally, they also tend to handle communications with employees and counsel them on their responsibilities, duties, and actions. They quite often help in building better performances and long-term um, existence within the organization. They may handle things like internal newsletters, internal reports as far as grievances are concerned. The internal part will vary from company to company, but there's almost always something that they're responsible for, especially with communication internally. And lastly is customer relations. I mean, interaction with the valued customers and potential customers is necessary to know their feedback, suggestions, interests, and priorities. The data is required to prepare for future business-related strategies. The public relations department and the experts who work in that really look at all of these major, basically, relationships that need to be maintained between the organization and those different groups. Each requires something different, each wants something different, and it's their job to make sure that we have basically a face of the organization that's taking care of these different types of relationships. PR staffs generally are responsible for the development and the circulation of information and managing events for the company. PR folks, you know, they have the power to engage customers and make them part of the brand's story and its telling. There are many different functions and duties that tend to fall within the public relations department. I'll cover a few of them here. I won't say that they're in every PR department. Some may fall in other areas, but it gives you a good idea of many of the duties and skills that you might need. Basically, press relations is sort of one of the big ones that 
we often see PR people doing. I mean, they create and place newsworthy information in the news media to attract attention to a person's products or services. The company uses, you know, press or media to provide information about their product and to their customers. They also will use it when there's questions about what's happening within a company or emergency situations if something has occurred. It will be the public relations department that will be responsible for that basic communications and relationship. When it comes to product publicity or basically publicizing some sort of a specific product, the company organizes the brand and product promotions through sponsorship to gather customers' attention. So we may go out and find, if you're in public relations, special events within the community or maybe even nationwide that would be good to link the company's name to to help sponsor, such as perhaps a walk for breast cancer. Public affairs definitely tends to fall under PR. They're basically about building and maintaining national or local community relations. You know, we do want to make sure that we have good relations with our local communities, as if they don't support us, it's going to be very difficult for a business to basically maintain a level of employment and to work smoothly within the zones that they're qualified to work in. With lobbying, we don't tend to think of lobbying as being a PR function. Unless a company has really hired a person outside, most lobbying is done by the PR department. I mean, they build and maintain relationships with legislators and government officials to influence you know, legislation and regulations. The PR experts communicate with the government officials and the legal departments to support both favorable regulations and try to defeat unfavorable ones. Now, what you may think of right away is some of these larger national laws that come into place, but businesses are often more ruled by local laws, by what's happening with the mayor's office, but what's happening within the county's offices, zoning and things like this. So they're usually very heavily invested in local um, work, whereas the national work may go to uh, professional lobbying organizations. We also have to work with basically members of nonprofit organizations, see if we can't gain some sort of financial or voluntary support for many of the activities that we wish to participate in or be members of. Now, remember, when we're talking about promotion, we may be talking about nonprofit organizations as much as we're talking about profit organizations. So one nonprofit needs to work with another nonprofit. So to save the turtles, we also probably need to work with the people about cleaning up the beach. When we talk about in-house journals, we're talking about, you know, many companies have their own magazines and booklets to promote the products among their customers. They also will tend to handle things like the annual reports, newsletters, websites, brochures that basically go right to our target markets. Now, public relations is also continuously engaged in providing information about the product and the brand through both internal and external communications. Many companies have their own internal newsletters, even their own internal shows. Disney had an internal show when I worked there that dealt with what was happening within the company, and they were a way for us to find out, being such a large conglomerate, what was going on. The public relations expert generally organizes events such as charity events, promotional events, or contests to capture the attention of the media. You know, like news conferences and speeches, brand tours, and grand openings, they may even do things like, I don't know, laser light shows or educational programs designed to reach out in, to our basically target audience. Car companies quite often do things about drunk driving and go to local high schools to talk about the dangers of drunk driving or how to drive safely in the rain or in the snow. When we talk about public service activities, we're talking about that companies often stand for specific social causes that their target market also will stand for. They invest their time and money and ask their employees to support these causes. This indirectly enhances our public relations within the organization, but again, quite often is our peer department that's going to go ahead and handle those functions and duties. And finally, you know, at times, Product failures or poor performances, the public relations department is going to offer suggestions and advice to management on how to handle the 
crisis or how to handle the relationships with the general public and what they feel will or will not work. And this allows management to make better decisions on hand to, how to handle emergency situations. We've covered a lot of information in this particular lecture. We've sort of done an introduction to the whole promotional mix. We covered basics of advertising. And what you see here are some of my favorite ads that I've seen around. And we've also covered what public relations is. As you can see, the promotional mix is rather complex and deep. But remember, no matter what, we still have to understand our target markets and needs and how we can fulfill those needs so that they're going to want and desire the products that we have.